Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. My name is Sydney Morris. I'm the co-founder of uh, e for e and I am here today in conversation. We've been having conversations all month long with amazing educators from across the e for e network in uh, commemoration of Women's History Month, talking about how women's leadership in the classroom and beyond shows up and is informed by our intersection identities. And today I'm super excited to be here and in conversation with a fabulous New York City public school teacher, Ife Damon. Ife is a high school special education and English teacher at Curtis High School in Staten Island. She is also a leading advocate for community-based learning and an amazing e for e teacher leader. Welcome and thanks for being here. Thank you, Sydney. I'm I'm proud to be here. I'm really honored. I love E for E. I love what they stand for. I love how they advocate for teachers, especially how I've been supported by E for E and, and my platform that I try to stand on. So thank you for having me. Well, I'm excited to dig in. Um, you know, we have been hearing and seeing staggering numbers that show us how COVID has disproportionately impacted women, particularly women of color, in workforce participation. And as an educator with children, you have been juggling caring for your own kiddos as well as your students at the same time. What has that been like for you and how have you managed it? It's been challenging, to be honest, you know, this is something that's new for all of us. This is a new way of living. And for me as a mom and teacher, unfortunately, there are times where my children, you know, in the moment have to get sacrificed in the beginning of the school year. Um, I was in the middle of teaching class and my son is walking in with his laptop. He's like, mommy, I need help. And I'm like, I'm in class. I can't help you. And it, it broke my heart. You know, it broke my heart that I, 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 you know, had to make that choice because my my natural born children and my students are all my babies, and so it was it was a very hurtful moment. But I was able to help them, you know, afterward. But it's been very hard. Um, my heart goes out to to any parent that has to, you know, be at home and work and help their children. You know, especially if you think about people who may not even be, you know very fluent in English and they have to help their children with all of this English content. Like it's just so much. And so it's been very overwhelming and it's really helped me to think about other people as well. And I've just, you know, I just hope we continue to find the balance. Yeah, I mean, you are, you are expressing uh, the experience of what we know to be true for so many tens of thousands of women across this country. We've literally seen hundreds of thousands of women drop out of the workforce to take care of their children. Um, when, when you think about those kinds of staggering numbers and the implications of COVID on the workforce, what do you think the lingering effects of this will be in the coming years? And how do you think we can reverse the negative impacts that this pandemic has had on women and mothers specifically? I think hopefully that there will be some initiatives that come out of some of the um, issues that we face that you're mentioning right now, as far as moms having to, you know, work, leave work in order to be able to be a support to their children. I know that that's been the case for many of my students personally. I hope that maybe there will be some sort of incentives for employers to um, hire moms or hire women who have left the workforce because of these um, situations, because of these conditions, and be sympathetic and understanding that they may not be um, as up on the skills as those individuals who have, you know, just been working through this pandemic all along. So, you know, I, I do hope to see that there'll be some sort of incentive um, to motivate organizations to bring those women back to the workforce when the time comes. Well, I would be fully supportive of that. I think that is, uh, you know, we are we are hopefully seeing policymakers direct their attention and their time and and their power and might uh, to to helping solve what is truly a, a, a crisis in our country. Um, when you think about education specifically, 
Um, what do you wish that education decision makers, whether that is our new uh, U.S. Secretary of Education or state leaders or uh, our new uh, school chancellor in New York City, um, who is a woman, um, what do you wish those kinds of education decision makers would do to better honor and infuse the diverse voices of women educators into their policy making choices? I think, um, well, I would like to see education just be completely revamped. So kind of looking at the traditional model that we've had for over 100 years and almost like just completely throwing it out in a sense. <laughs> and I'm very radical. I know that I'm very radical in my ways of thinking about education. But, um, but the reason why I am is because I've seen how the traditional paradigm has not worked for many. Um, it works for some and it has and it will always, but for many, it does not. And that many includes, of course, those who are mar in marginalized groups, but also, well, yeah, those who are marginalized groups. So me as a special education teacher, you know, that just goes across all races, but then we can get more specifically and look at, you know, how it impacts um, different races or how it impacts different genders. Like there are just many ways that we need to revamp it because it's, it's too passive in many ways. It's not active. It's not engaging students. I, I feel like education right now only prepares children for up to age 22. And I do feel like we are not preparing with this, you know, only college, red, college readiness focus. We're not preparing children for life to be citizens of the world. We're just only preparing them to be college students. And so I would like to see a revamping of education in which we actually really focus on developing citizens who are tolerant and compassionate and, you know, um, have a global mindset, but still act locally. Yeah, if there, if there ever was a moment, I think, to question why are things the way they have been, uh, it is now, right? And um, there's a lot of talk about when things go back to normal and I very much agree with you. We, we can't just go back to normal when it comes to public education because normal wasn't working. Normal wasn't serving all of our students. Um, and I, I'd be curious to hear from your perspective. Obviously, teaching during this pandemic has presented a whole host of challenges, some of which we've already talked about. Um, but have there been any silver linings? Have there been any innovations that you have seen come out of this time that you would want to carry forward into the future of education in a post-pandemic world? Yes, absolutely. I would say one of the first things that I would say is that the virtual world is like um, it's bringing introverts out of their shell. And so I love that, you know, like, I, I feel like the, this time is the time for introverts because now they still get to stay, you know, in their safe spaces at home or, you know, wherever their safe space is at, they may not have to turn on the camera. And I'll speak for like students specifically, you know, so like I can hear more from introverts in the chat. For example, you know, they'll share in the chat when you talk about innovation for me, um, applications, programs like Nearpod are, have been major for me. That's extremely innovative. I had never used anything like that before we, you know, this pandemic uh, came. And so that is an awesome way to get all students involved. I feel like my class participation has increased even more as a result of using a program like Nearpod because it's very low stakes for students. Um, they can answer anonymously and I still get to assess them because even though it's anonymous as far as face, you know, sharing the screen, I can still see who's answering what. And so it allows me to assess my students and it allows them to feel safe to, um, to share in a virtual space. So, so yeah, absolute silver lining. We definitely plan on still trying to find ways to use, even when we go back into the building, like how can we utilize these new um, programs that we started to implement in this virtual space, how can we still maintain those? And I honestly hope that there will still be some sort of virtual aspect or virtual option for students moving forward. Because another thing that I saw was that some students who were, um, 
like didn't come to class for whatever reason, maybe they had to stay home, take care of a, an elderly parent or whatever the reason may be. Once we went virtual, they started to show up because they didn't have to leave. So I do hope that these options for students who didn't show up in the building because of whatever reason are available to them so that they can actually continue their learning and have more success. Well, th those sound like some, some great takeaways and innovations to carry forward. And, and this is something that we have seen with our work um, with teachers across the country in a recent survey that we did nationally of America's public school teachers we, we similarly heard a common theme of let's take some of the things that we have seen actually deliver different results despite, you know, the challenges of this time and carry them forward. And a lot of the things you named around student engagement, ways of assessing, um, opportunities to, you know, help cater to lots of different learning modalities are some of the things that um, we heard and, and also opportunities to engage with, with parents and communities differently, um, moving away from our sort of antiquated system of two times a year parent teacher conferences that have to happen on a certain night at a certain time and thinking about how can we better leverage technology to really improve the kind of dialogue um, that, that happens between uh, school and, and home. Um, you mentioned Nearpod, and I'm wondering if there are any other resources that you're using in your classroom related to this conversation that you want to share with others. Um, Nearpod is the primary one at this point because it has so many features. Like, I do like Mentimeter because it, it you know, it's a nice way to take a quick poll, and I love, you know, it's, it's nice for the students to be able to see their words in different ways. But Nearpod is definitely one of the tops I have used, like actively learn because they have a nice library of text, you know, for the literature side of things. Um, of course, you know, Zoom is new <laughs> for, you know, for me. Uh, we're using Google Meet at one point, but we found that Zoom kind of actually lends itself better because we have the breakout room feature, with, which is something that we're still, you know, it's still new for us, but it is a great way to now that we've built that family environment in the classroom to start to get the students to feel safe to at least communicate in a collaborative manner in a smaller safe space. Well, Ike, thank you so, so much for taking the time out to Zoom with me after what I imagine has been a long school day of Zoom and to engage in this dialogue. Thank you for everything that you do for the students in New York City. Um, it's been great to be in discussion with you. And for everybody watching, we will continue to share perspectives from amazing E4E members in the coming days and would love for you to participate by joining in with us on social media. Thanks so much. Thank you, Sydney. Take care.